everyone. Welcome to another episode of Orbital Rendezvous. I am Chaitanya Giri. In this episode, we have with us Terry Van Haren, who is the inaugural president and director of Leo Labs Australia, which is a subsidiary of the global space situational awareness company Leo Labs. Terry joined Leo Labs uh, uh, very recently after an illustrious 35 years service in the Royal Australian Air Force. He served the Air Force as a commander, a director, a fighter, a fighter pilot, and a weapons officer. And he has over 6,000 hours of flying experience in his service, uh, out of which 4,000 hours have been on uh, fighting fast jets is what he says. Uh, Terry uh, is a veteran, not only of the Royal Australian Air Force, but he's also served as the Air and Space Attaché at, uh, to the United States uh, in the Australian Embassy in Washington, DC, uh, where he has developed great uh, synergies between the Australian Space Program and the American Space Program. And uh, through his illustrious uh, work experience, he brings best of the both worlds uh, interacting with the government departments as well as with the industry. So, Terry, uh, welcome to Interstellar and welcome to this particular program. Well, it's good to see you again, Dr. Gary, and I'm looking forward to our discussions. Uh, uh, very recently, uh, uh, a very peculiar incident make, made news all over the world. And that incident was uh, Leo Labs radars detecting a Chinese spy space plane maneuvering in the Earth's orbit and making some very uh, intricate uh, rendezvous and proximity operations. Now, rendezvous and proximity uh, operations, just for those who are uninitiated, uh, are a sort of operations where a certain spacecraft approaches another spacecraft in a very controlled manner and tries to snoop into or tries to look into uh, the details, the physical details as well as the functional details of the target spacecraft. Uh, now, this intricate operation was done by uh, uh, the PLA SSF, which is the uh, strategic support forces of the PLA. But very interestingly, a commercial space situational awareness company uh, detected this operation from its ground-based radars that are located all over the world. So my question to you, Terry, is uh, how advanced uh, are uh, the Chinese space capabilities uh, when it comes to rendezvous and proximity operations? Yeah, that's a good question. So we, we watched uh, this uh, particular um, space flight there, which was actually just over 270 days in orbit uh, between August last year and, and the 8th of May. And um, the, the Chinese spacecraft here, the, the space plane, uh, did a number of maneuvers in uh, low Earth orbit changing uh, its orbits and eventually it raised its orbit to uh, 650 kilometers and started a number of tests for rendezvous and proximity operations. It was around um, October last year that we actually saw um, the space plane deploy a sub-satellite. Uh, we called it Object J and then it did a series of maneuvers to rendezvous and we looks like captured that, um, that satellite um, and then it went into two more series of um, uh, rendezvous proximity operations where we saw evidence that Object J, so the sub-satellite, was actually maneuvering as well. So it was doing little uh, maneuvers and burns. And um, so the next two events, in fact, uh, looked uh, a lot more complex in terms of rendezvous and proximity operations against the maneuvering target. And um, that concluded uh, early April. Uh, the, all the tests looked very successful and uh, they're, they're fairly impressive the way they were uh, operating. Uh, after which we saw the uh, space plane come back down to 350 kilometers and then about uh, two or three weeks later it, it deorbited and landed back in China. So when you put this all together this shows you that the, uh, the PRC space plane now is uh, a multi-orbit capability. It can change orbits, can maneuver around, it can do automated uh, rendezvous with proximity operations against um, other objects there and also potentially uh, satellites that are actually maneuvering. And that's a fairly advanced capability. 
That's um, something we haven't seen before. And in fact, this this was the second flight of the uh, the Chinese space plane. The first one was only a uh, a four orbit sort of uh, test, if you like, to uh, enter low Earth orbit and then uh, deorbit. So this this is really a uh, a culminating event, I think, in terms of uh, showing the capability they have now with this uh, space plane. It's been modelled on the um, Boeing X-37B, so the US space plane, and you could say that they've sort of closed the gap. They've shown that they've got capability now similar to uh, those more modern space planes. So fairly impressive from what they've done. Hey, when we talk about rendezvous and uh, proximity operations, uh, you very often find commercial companies uh, speaking about it from the point of view of repairs or replenishment. But when it comes to uh, the military side of things, uh, it is usually attributed to some sort of, uh, uh, it is usually considered a nefarious activity uh, if it is done in a clandestine manner. And if it is done in a blatant manner openly, it is considered as an act of uh, conflict. Uh, so how do you foresee which of the two the civilian operations as well as or the military operations will take a lot of precedence in the coming years given the volatile geopolitics uh, of the world well look everything is dual use in space is what we always say um, every um, spacecraft can be used for civil and commercial operations and military operations um, this type of spacecraft firstly it is reusable so there's a uh, advantage there that uh, it can take something into orbit then bring um, payloads back out of orbit of course, it also has a, um, it, it's such that the payload that does, takes into orbit or, or recovers from orbit is covert. We can't see what it is because of the spacecraft actually captures it and uh, holds it inside its its uh, payload bay. Um, but then, you know, I think we, as a, as a company for Leo Labs, we look at the characteristics of, of the spacecraft and see, you know, what it's capable of, how it maneuvers, whether it's automated, um, where these behaviors are occurring. And I, actually, we don't really speculate too much on, on what they're actually doing. Uh, as a commercial company, our, our ad here is uh, transparency. We'd like to uh, make people aware of what's going on so people can think about the ramifications. But you, you're correct, this type of spacecraft does bring in a whole bunch of different possibilities. Um, the, the Chinese are saying that it's gonna be for peaceful uses. And uh, but we know that the Chinese behaviors here, they're developing really strategic capabilities quite quickly. And of course, they couldn't use them um, in a whole bunch of different ways, depending on what uh, satellites they take into orbit, what uh, any other sensors or systems they carry inside the spacecraft and how they use them. So I think we just need to be on our guard to watch what's go happens next. I, I would think that after this particular uh, test that we've just seen that and, and as I say, we it looks highly successful that we will see the, uh, the uh, Chinese potentially, you know, go into production of this spacecraft. We might in a few years see a number of them flying in, in low Earth orbit, um, doing different missions. And this is where we actually probably need to work together to keep tracking, to make sure we know where they are, what they're doing. Um, and with our data, we like to then um, provide it to other sensor platforms that can uh, do orbital inspection and actually find out you know, more information about what they're actually up to. I sometimes say distrust what they're doing and, and verify, uh, but we're part of that process, not the solution. But I, I, I think it's important we um, have very close tracking of these activities. Yeah, uh, you've just mentioned that you're part of the process and you do not speculate much. Uh, now, this whole event is quite interesting to me uh, for the very reason that uh, here you have a commercial space situational awareness company who is now able to detect uh, clandestine operations happening in space. And once you make the detection public, uh, it sort of uh, sends uh, you know, a lot of tremors uh, in terms of, uh, uh, so it sends tremors and it sends shivers, especially to military space operators. Uh, for the very reason that all this while, uh, these uh, uh, military space operators were uh, operating without any uh, oversight from the public domain, uh, from the commercial domain. And here you, you have uh, a commercial SSA uh, detecting a military operation. Now, 
how do you see this uh, how do you see the chinese reacting to this well um that's a really good point you know the commercial space surveillance systems that are now um coming along are really adding transparency to all operations uh, and that's one of our mantras we're, we're trying to uh, add that transparency so people and countries and actors are held to account a little bit more um so that's an important point now one thing everyone needs to understand is there's no hiding in space you're, you're, you're observable from every country of the world right that has any sort of capability to observe what's going on as as, as to whether it's actually reported or not in the public domain is the, the question now the reaction to the chinese i think you know even seeing they'd be seeing uh, some of our um even this interview uh, they'd be understanding that um they there's going to be a, a novel layer to transparency. This actually helps uh, dip smaller countries, all the countries around the world in some respects, uh, think about this, the, the politics of what's going on in space. Um, think about, you know, the safe and uh, responsible use of the space environment. And I think uh, is a deterrent effect in itself, you know, to, to understand it's not the superpowers playing anymore. It's actually the, the global community that's actually concerned about some of these things. And that, I think, empowers uh, many countries around the world, Australia included, to um, to call out uh, irresponsible behaviours. Now, we've got some concern with this, but I'll take you back to uh, our reporting on the breakup of Cosmos 1408 after the Russian ASAP. We were, the, we were one of the first companies to actually talk about the debris field, uh, where the debris field was from the breakup after the uh, Russian ASAP and its impact on commercial and civil space operations. And... Um, Again, since that sort of uh, transparency is coming out of a commercial company, uh, I think even countries like China, Russia and, and others need to take note that, uh, yes, that they're going to be held accountable. They're going to have to explain themselves in different forums all around the world. So this is what we're trying to do is bring the transparency to the space game, which is, hasn't been there for uh, you know many decades. Uh, my last and final question would be uh, that are you foreseeing uh, the Chinese uh, space ecosystem to come with a Leo Labs equivalent or a Leo Labs competitor? Uh, they have a geographical advantage because uh, uh, they can deploy uh, their radars in some of the Belt and Road Initiative countries. Uh, do you see that happening from there? Um, well, I, I, I think what now that we um, have commercial opportunities in space surveillance and we have opportunities to build our infrastructure very quickly, um, I think you're seeing, and this is actually not just in space surveillance, this goes to launch as well. Really, the, the best big space race that's on at the moment, I call it you know, the commercial space race that's been coming out of America and hopefully been India soon as well. Uh, you know, that's the launch sector in the United States with SpaceX scaling and all the commercial satellites are being deployed. That's a race in itself. That's adding mass. That is uh, setting a pace. And the other side of the uh, space race is the uh, Chinese activities, which are still government controlled and operated. And of course, they are also scaling and, and, catch, and, and creating new capabilities very quickly. So it's a, it's a bit of a, it's a competition. It's a competition. And um, I think, We'll see how it goes, but this, the biggest strength the West has, I think, is the commercial space industry. The commercial space industry can do things quicker than governments now, and they can do things cheaper than governments, and they can add, you know, transparency to the space environment. Um, so I won't predict the future too much to say that we are, I mean, Leo Labs is building uh, radars and capability quite quickly now um, in friendly countries all around the world. And I think we have more friendly countries around the world than... Um, non-cooperative states. So that's probably the, the great um, thing that sort of gives me confidence to say that, you know, I think we'll keep up with the changes in these issues and have the, um, the global infrastructure in place to actually monitor these activities and uh, keep everyone updated. Terry, my last question would be uh, that when you mention friendly countries, and I've asked this uh, before to you, uh, uh, do you mean countries that belong to the 5i grouping or countries belonging to nato or you have a wider bandwidth no we, we we when we talk commercially we talk uh basically cooperative western nations 
<clears throat> which is the, the big list. That's hundreds of countries. The, um, the only countries where we're commercially restricted are the ones that are sanctioned, unsanctioned lists, you know, commercially. <clears throat> it's the same sort of commercial sanction list that are run, running for uh, other telecom com uh, companies out of the United States. And it's very similar to, to other business. So that gives us a lot of flexibility and gives us a lot of uh, uh, opportunity. And um, it becomes a unifying factor. So we are, I, and this is why I was basically saying, you know, we're telling you the objective truth. We're, we're, we're reporting what we see. We're not going to speculate. We're not going to go into the intelligence market. We don't want to do that. We want to become the transparent agent of what's going on. And governments can worry about the so what, but we will keep doing what we do to make sure that the, uh, the space environment does become a transparent environment. It's, we'll support commercial spacecraft, we'll support civilian operations, and hopefully, you know, we'll improve the, um, the system of operations there for both sustainability of operations low Earth orbit and deterrence. And, and sometimes deterrence is the it's all about information. You know, it's all about um, making sure there's transparency. So these these are things that we offer. But um, yeah, we, we have a very big community of um, nations all around the world that, that want uh, safe space operations, responsible space operations, and uh, they want their own commercial growth. So I think there's more unity in that than actually the uh, competition that's going on, you know, between the bigger nations. So with that, we come to the end of this episode. What we've learned from Terry Van Harren here is that the global space economy is booming. Uh, the activities footprint in outer space, especially in the Earth's orbit, is going to increase tremendously. And to secure the vast interest of the global commercial sector, which is not restricted to a few countries, but across the geopolitical bloc. It is very important to ensure transparency and it is very important to ensure uh, uh, you know, openness of operation. And to do that, companies like Leo Labs will play a major role in the coming years and their role is going to get more prominent each passing day. With that, we come to the uh, end of this episode. Uh, do like, share and subscribe uh, to our channel and keep supporting us uh, as we bring to you great content that ensures knowledge and uh, uh, growth of uh, the global space ecosystem. Thank you so much. Thank you.